This is my geometry course. Today we're going to continue to learn special quadrilaterals. If you haven't done the homework completely and correctly from the last class, do that homework before watching this video. Now in the previous class, we learned so many theorems that this is a good opportunity to uh, review structuring two column proofs. And we're going to prove those theorems. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I, I don't want to do proofs anymore. I, I don't really like proofs. Well, I understand that. But uh, remember, proofs are a big part of this course. In most math courses, you don't have to prove theorems. You just have to know how to use them. But in geometry, it's something that uh, you just have to do. And you may have noticed that I don't require you to prove every theorem that we learned in this course. And that, that's the way it is with most math courses. You don't have to you know, prove every theorem. But we do have to review proofs and uh, get more and more practice with the two column proofs. So that said, uh, let's get started. Before we uh, dive into the, the proofs, I want you to take screenshots um, of these definitions. You may already have screenshots uh, in your files, but just so you don't have to go and access those, you can take screenshots now. Now please take screenshots because I don't want to go back to these again and again. Those are all the definitions of the uh, special quadrilaterals we learned in previous classes. And here's the parallelogram uh, theorems. So you get a screenshot of that. And here's the quadrilateral theorems we learned in the previous classes. Get screenshots of those. Because uh, we may want to refer back to these. And one more screenshot there. And let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start off with some really easy proofs. It says, if the quadrilateral ABCD below is a square, then it's a rectangle. So if this quadrilateral is a square, then that shows that it must be a rectangle. But we have to prove that. So we're going to start out with the given information. ABCD is a square. And if ABCD is a square, I want you to look at your uh, definitions. If we know that ABCD is a square, that means that the angles are all right angles. That's just the definition of a square. So angle A, angle B, angle C, and angle D are right angles. definition of a square. <clears throat> now we know uh, that if all the angles, all the interior angles are uh, right angles, then that shows that it, the quadrilateral must be a rectangle because that's the definition of a rectangle. The difference between a square and a rectangle is that a square has all sides uh, congruent. Uh, squares are rectangles, but rectangles are not necessarily squares. So because all these angles are right angles, that means that A, B, C, D is a rectangle. And that is the definition of a rectangle. So we proved that if a quadrilateral is a square, it must be a rectangle. So I want you to try number two. You're going to need those definitions right in front of you. So be sure to have those. Go ahead and try number two. And when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. We'll start with the given information. So EFGH is a square. That's a given. And we have to prove that it's a rhombus. Now, if EFGH is a square, that means that all the sides are congruent. EF is congruent to FG, which is congruent to GH, which is congruent to EH. And that is just the definition of a square. So because all the sides are congruent, 
that proves that EFGH is a rhombus. Because that's just the definition of a rhombus. Um, a rhombus is a quadrilateral with all four sides congruent. So we prove that if a quadrilateral is a square, then it must be a rhombus. So if you got those answers, good job. Um, your your answer may be slightly different, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. But if the, if the, if you use the same logic, you got the right answer there. You proved it. So on to number three here. If the quadrilateral IJKL below is a rhombus. If we know that this quadrilateral is a rhombus, then its diagonals bisect the inner angles. So what that means is if you draw a diagonal, that means this angle is congruent to this angle, and this angle is congruent to this angle. Now it turns out that all four of those angles are actually congruent. You can prove that pretty easily, but we're not trying to prove that. We're just trying to prove that this angle is congruent to this angle, and this angle is congruent to this angle. Now, in order to do a complete proof, you'd have to draw this diagonal and then do another proof showing that this angle is congruent to this angle and this angle is congruent to this angle, but that would be, be the exact same proof, so we don't need to do that twice. But if you're going to, again, if you're going to do a complete proof, you'd have to do it for both those diagonals. So I'm going to draw this diagonal and just prove that this angle is congruent to this angle, and so on and so forth. So we're going to start with the given information. We know that IJKL. is a rhombus and you know before we actually do this I should probably you know tell you exactly what we're going to do here give you an overview so you can already you can probably already see what we're going to do we're going to show that this triangle is congruent to this triangle and then corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent and that's that's pretty much it now this problem can be a little bit confusing because you have isosceles triangles so it's kind of difficult to see what, what parts are corresponding because there's more than one way to do it. But uh, let's try not to think to get too confused about that. So we now we, we know that all the sides are congruent. We know that uh, IJ is congruent to uh, JK, which is congruent to KL which is congruent to IL. And we know that because it's the definition of a rhombus. Again, if we know that this is a rhombus, by definition, all the sides must be congruent. So <clears throat> we also know that IK is congruent to itself. And that's the reflexive property of congruence. And so therefore we know that triangle JIK is congruent to triangle. Now this is the part that's a little confusing. These are isosceles triangles, obviously, because this side is congruent to this side, because it's, we know those sides are congruent. And this side's congruent to this side, so obviously they're isosceles triangles. But what that means is you can write the congruence statement uh, in in different ways, and it'll, it'll still be correct. But we have to write the 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 the, the, the correct order. So J I K uh, is going to be congruent to uh, L I K, just because we need to prove that these two angles are uh, congruent. Therefore, we're going to consider those to be corresponding angles. But again, it's a little confusing because these are isosceles triangles. You could also say that this angle is corresponding with this angle, and that would be true also if you did a different uh, congruent statement for your triangles. But again, try not to be confused by that. Um, so that is the SSS triangle congruence postulate. So now we can say that, that uh, corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So we know that angle um, JIK is congruent to angle LIK, and we also know that uh, angle JKI, 
is congruent to angle LKI. And corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So again, just to be clear, what we did here, we proved that this angle is congruent to this angle, and this angle is congruent to this angle. Again, it turns out that all those angles are congruent anyway, all four of them, but uh, we're not really proving that. So that was uh, number three. And um, I want you to try number four. Number four is pretty much the same problem, but now we're dealing with kites. It says, if the quadrilateral ABCD below is a kite, then the angles between congruent sides are bisected by the diagonal connecting the vertices of those angles. Now, I know that seems really complicated, but all that's saying is that if you draw this diagonal, then uh, this angle is bisected and this angle is bisected. So it's kind of the, the same type of uh, proof. And, you know, I, I think you're, you can figure this out on your own. Uh, you know, it's pretty obvious how you're going to do this, but you need to be aware. Remember, the definition of a kite is it's a quadrilateral with exactly two pairs of uh, congruent sides. So that means that this side is congruent to this side, and this side is congruent to this side. Very important to understand that, or else you're not going to be able to do this proof. So go ahead and uh, attempt this problem. This is called the kite angle bisector theorem. We learned this theorem in the previous class or whenever we learn that theorem. So go ahead and try uh, number four, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. So let's go ahead and draw that diagonal. And we're gonna start out with the given information, ABCD is a kite, and that is given. Now, because it's a kite, we know that AD is congruent to DC. And we also know that AB is congruent to uh, BC. And how do we know that? Well, that's just the definition of a kite. Exactly two pairs of congruent sides. Um, we also know, of course, that BD is congruent to itself, and that is the reflexive property of congruence. And now, as you can imagine, we're going to say that triangle ABD is congruent to triangle um, CBD. And that is just the SSS triangle congruence postulate. So now that we know that those triangles are congruent, we can say the corresponding parts are congruent. So that means that angle ADB is congruent to angle CDB and angle ABD is congruent to angle CBD. And that is CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So as you can see, that was pretty much the exact same problem that we did uh, for number three. Um, so if you got those answers, good job. If you got stuck, that's okay. But uh, you know, just understand, it's it's the, pretty much the exact same problem we did in uh, number three. <clears throat> so now let's go on to number four, or excuse me, number five. Um, it says here, if the quadrilateral EFGH below is a rectangle, then it's a parallelogram. So if, this, if, if we know that this quadrilateral is a rectangle, then we're going to prove that that means it has to be a parallelogram. And this proof is going to be a little weird, um, but it, the, the concept is simple. We know that this is a rectangle, and the definition of a rectangle is a quadrilateral with uh, all inner angles 90 degrees. So we know that these angles are 90 degrees. In fact, I can just draw boxes there because we know they're 90 degrees. Now, if they are 90 degrees, 
we can use the uh, consecutive interior angles converse theorem. So if you consider this to be a transversal and this to be uh, uh, two line, uh, the transversal uh, is going through those two lines, then if we can show that these two angles are supplementary, that proves that these two lines proves that these two lines are parallel. So it's the converse. Remember in the transversal course, we first learned that if, if two lines are parallel, then that says a lot about the angles. So if we have two lines that we know are parallel and you have a transversal, then corresponding angles are congruent and alternate interior angles are congruent and so on and so forth. But now we're going backwards. We're saying that if, if you have two angles uh, that are corresponding, or that two, two corresponding angles that are congruent, that proves that these uh, lines are parallel. But this is the fourth theorem. This is the consecutive angles uh, theorem. That means that if, if two angles are supplementary, two consecutive interior angles are supplementary, that proves that these lines are parallel. So if we can show that these line segments are parallel, and also these line segments are parallel, then we can prove that uh, the rectangle is a parallelogram, because that's the definition of a parallelogram. So let's get started. Um, this uh, quadrilateral EFGH is a rectangle. Probably the most intimidating part of this proof is that you got to remember the uh, consecutive interior angles converse theorem. And a lot of students don't even remember that. That was quite a while ago. But again, uh, I'm going to already, sh already sh told you about the, the, the theorem, and I'll put that on the screen. By the way, it's down here. I just remembered I put it down here. So if you forgot that, again, that's from the transversals class. I know it's annoying that you have to go back and remember these theorems, but I'm giving you the theorems, so I'm, I'm making it easy for you. Uh, when you do your test and you have to study for your test, I, I, you know, I'll give you a list of all these theorems and postulates, so don't worry about it. Now, we only need to use th uh, three angles. So we're going to say angle E, angle F, and angle H are right angles. Now you might be thinking, why, why are we only using three? Well, you'll, you'll see why we only need to use three angles. And that is just the definition. We know that because it's the definition of a rectangle. Now, if those are right angles, we know that the measure of angle E is 90 degrees. The measure of angle F is 90 degrees. And the measure of angle H is also 90 degrees. And that's just the definition of a right angle. Now this next step is going to be a little weird. This is something that we haven't done yet. Um, the measure of angle E plus the measure of angle F has to be uh, 90 plus 90. And I'm just going to call that substitution. There may be a little uh, ambiguity in terms of uh, why we're using the substitution rule. But that's probably uh, that probably explains it sufficiently. Um, and we also know that uh, the measure of angle E plus the measure of angle H is 90 plus 90. So I'm kind of just plugging in 90 and uh, moving from left to right there. Again, that, that is kind of a weird step. We haven't done that before. And you're going to have one, one problem in the homework that requires you to do that. So now I'm just going to simplify. The measure of angle E plus the measure of angle F is 180. And the measure of angle E plus the measure of angle H is 180. And that's just simplification. Um, so now we know that angle E and angle F are supplementary 
and angle E and angle H are supplementary. Sorry, it's kind of cramped there. And that's just the definition of supplementary angles. So now that we know that they're uh, supplementary, uh, we can say that EF is parallel to HG. And also we know that E EH is parallel to FG. And that is the consecutive interior angles converse theorem. Again, if, if angles are uh, supplementary, if these angles are supplementary, then that proves that EH is parallel to FG. And if these angles are supplementary, that proves that FE is parallel to HG. So you can see we didn't really need G. We didn't need the angle G. So now that we know that those uh, segments are parallel, by definition, EFGH is a parallelogram. Definition of a, and sometimes you're going to kind of run out of room with these, so I can just write the symbol for a parallelogram. Um, so that was uh, number five. Um, you may want to take a screenshot of that theorem. Actually, take a, take a screenshot of this entire problem because the next problem you're going to do is uh, very similar to this one. Um, so on to number six. Now, this problem is going to be uh, very similar to number five, but instead of using the consecutive interior angles converse theorem, you're going to use the alternate interior angles converse theorem. You're going to have to draw diagonals. So you can use this diagonal, or you can use this diagonal. You're going to get the same answer. But I'm going to use this diagonal. So you should probably use that one so you can uh, check your answer when I do this problem. Uh, also, be aware that uh, when you write your congruence statement, it can get kind of confusing because uh, in the previous problems, we saw that when you're dealing with a rhombus, you have uh, uh, isosceles triangles. So in order to do this proof, we're going to show that these two triangles are congruent. And then we're going to use angles to show that this uh, rhombus is a parallelogram. So, um, but, but the confusing part is that you need to use the, the right corresponding parts. So we're going to use this. This part is going to be corresponding with, with this part, those uh those sides. And if you don't do it that way, then you're, you're going to get kind of confused. Same thing here. You need this part to be corresponding with this part. The only reason that there's any ambiguity is because, again, these are isosceles triangles. Uh, so you can say that this side is congruent to this side, but that doesn't really help us as far as the congruence statement, because that's not going to help us show that this uh, triangle is parallel. You have to show that these two sides are parallel, and uh, these two sides are parallel, and so on and so forth. So try number six, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. Um, we know that uh, ABCD is a rhombus. And uh, because it's a rhombus, we know that uh, the sides are, are uh, congruent, but it's again, it's, it's important that you do this correctly. So AD, we're going to say that that's congruent, congruent to uh, BC. And we also want to say that DC is congruent to uh, AB. And that's just the definition of a rhombus. Um, we also know that, of course, BD is congruent to itself. 
by the reflexive property of congruence. And therefore, we can say that triangle A, ADB, now this is where you have to be careful. Mathematicians want you to write these congruent statements in the right order. So ADB, we're going to say that is congruent to, and just to be clear, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the sides. So this side, we're, we're going to say is congruent to this side. And so ADB, the triangle ADB, must be congruent to triangle C, B, D by the SSS triangle congruence postulate. But again, since we're uh, assuming that these are corresponding sides, we have to write the congruence statement in the same order, even though, again, it doesn't really matter because these are isosceles triangles. So now that we know that those triangles are congruent, we can say that corresponding parts are congruent. So I'm going to start out with angle ADB. Angle ADB, this angle here is congruent to uh, this angle here. So ADB is congruent to CBD. And we can also say that um, this angle here, angle CDB, is congruent to angle uh, this angle here, which is DBA. And that is corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So by, sh by showing those angles are congruent, um, we can use the alternate interior angles converse theorem. Now I know it's kind of hard to see, but just using these angles as an example, um, if you have a line here and a line here and a transversal, again, the hardest part of, of visualizing this is you have to ignore you have to ignore these line segments. Just pretend that they're not there, and you can see why this this uh, we're dealing with transversals. So if these two interior th these two angles that I drew are um, these angles here are alternate interior angles. So if we know that those angles are congruent, then because the converse of that theorem works, we can we if we know that those two angles are congruent, then that means that DC is parallel to AB. And then we're, that, that'll prove that, uh, at least that'll be part of the proof that'll show that this is a parallelogram. So because those angles are uh, congruent, that proves that DC is parallel to AB, and it also proves that AD is parallel to BC. Um, and that is the alternate interior angles converse theorem. And now, because we know that those sides are parallel, that proves that ABCD is a parallelogram. And that's just the definition of a parallelogram, and you can just draw a parallelogram there because it's kind of hard to fit the entire word there. Um, so if you got something similar to that, good job. Um, if you got a little confused by the order of the lettering there, I'm sorry about that, but again, these are isosceles triangles, so it's a little weird to consider the, the order. Now for the next problem, I don't really have uh, an example for you to do, but we're going to do this together, and there's going to be a problem like this in the homework involving the diagonals of a, of a trapezoid. So let's just do this one together. It says, if the quadrilateral IJKL below is a rectangle, then its diagonals are congruent. So if we know that this is a rectangle, that means that the diagonals are going to be the same length. We have to prove that. Um, and the way we're going to prove this is we're going to consider um, this triangle here, and also uh, this triangle here. And we're going to prove that those two triangles are congruent. And if they're congruent, then corresponding parts are, be, are going to be congruent. But it's, it's best if I go ahead and take this out and uh, 
draw it so we don't get confused. So this is I, J, K, and um, this other triangle is going to be I, J, L. Um, and notice that we're using I, J in both of these. I, J is common to both of these. We're doing that on purpose. So I think I have that right. Um, all right, so we're going to start out with the given information. IJKL is a rectangle. And first of all, we know um, that IJ is congruent to itself because we're going to prove these two triangles are congruent. So IJ is congruent to itself. Reflexive property of congruence. But now we need to show that this side is congruent to this side. And we need to prove, uh, well, that, that's, all, that's what we need to do. We need to prove that this side is congruent to this side. And we can't really do that unless we first show that the rectangle is a parallelogram. So we're going to say that I, J, K, L is a parallelogram. Now we proved in a previous problem that if a rectangle, uh, if, if a quadrilateral is a rectangle, then it's a parallelogram. So that's the rectangle parallelogram theorem. So that's what we're going to write here. We know it's a parallelogram because of the um, rectangle parallelogram theorem, and I'm drawing shapes there because we don't really have room to draw the, 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 the names. So now that we know it's a parallelogram, we can use the parallelogram opposite sides theorem. So um, we know that I, L is congruent to uh, J, K. And that is the uh, parallelogram opposite sides theorem. That's one of the four theorems that we learned in uh, a couple classes ago. Remember, these are our parallelogram theorems. If we know that it, uh, quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then opposite sides are congruent. Now, we know that um, angle I and uh, also angle J are right angles. So this angle here, J and I, they're right angles. And that's just the definition of a rectangle. If we know this is a rectangle, we know that all those angles are right angles. That's the definition. We don't have to prove that. It's just, it's just the definition of a rectangle. So now you can imagine what we're going to do here. We know that, uh, let me get a highlighter here. We know this side is congruent to this side. And we know this side is congruent to this side by the reflexive property of congruence. And we know that those that angle between them is the same. It's a, it's a right angle. So we can say that uh, triangle IJL is congruent to triangle. Now, you have to get the right, the right order of the letters, so be aware of that. Um, IJL is congruent to JIK. And that is the SAS congruence postulate. So now that we know that those are congruent, we can say that IK is congruent to um, JL. And that is corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So we proved that the diagonals, these lengths here, are congruent. So again, I don't have a problem for you to do like that, but uh, you are going to try one of those in the uh, in the homework. I didn't really need that space there, so I can just move that up. 
Um, but for the next problem, I do have uh, an example problem for you. So let's go to number number eight. So we'll do number eight together, and you can do a similar problem for number nine. If the quadrilateral EFGH below is a rhombus, then its diagonals are perpendicular. This is the rhombus perpendicular diagonals theorem. So what we're going to do is we're going to show that these diagonals are perpendicular. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to prove that um, we can just two, choose two of these uh, uh, triangles. I'm going to choose this one and this one, and we're going to show that they're congruent. Turns out all four of them are congruent. I know it doesn't look that way, the way that my rhombus is drawn, but we only need to show that two of the triangles are congruent. So again, I'm going to use this one and this one, and that's going to, we can then say that corresponding parts are congruent, so that means that this angle is congruent to this angle, but those two angles also form a linear pair. We're going to have to use the linear pair postulate. So let's go ahead and get started. We know that EFGH is a uh, rhombus. And we know that all the sides must be congruent. But we don't care about all the sides. We just care about EH and HG because those are the two triangles that I'm going to use, this triangle and this triangle. And we know that because it's just the definition of a rhombus. All the sides must be congruent. Now at this point I would like to use a theorem that we've actually already proven. Remember we proved this theorem, the, uh, where is that? We proved the uh, rhombus angle bisector theorem. So if a quadrilateral is a rhombus, then the angles are bisected um, by the diagonals. So that's called the rhombus angle bisector theorem. So we can say that, and you know, I need to label this intersection point, I'm going to label it I. We can say that angle IHG is congruent to uh, angle EHI. And that is the rhombus angle bisector theorem. And now we need to say that HI is congruent to itself by the reflexive property of congruence. And because we have all of this information here, we can say that triangle EHI is congruent, and we got to make sure we get the right order here, is congruent to um, GHI by the SAS triangle congruence postulate. So again, we know these two sides are congruent. And we know that this side is the same. It's the same in each triangle. And we also know that these angles are congruent in the triangle. Therefore, we can use SAS. Now that we know the triangles are congruent, we can say that corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So we can say that angle EIH is congruent to angle GIH, and that is corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And now we also know that um, angle EIH, those two angles we just mentioned, and angle GIH form a linear pair. And that's just the definition of a linear pair. Now, because those are a linear pair, um, and by the way, we know those are a linear pair simply because, remember, a linear pair of angles is 
uh, two, two adjacent angles whose non-common sides are opposite rays. Now these sides are not exactly rays, but uh, they're still opposite. So we can see that uh, those two angles, because they're adjacent, they share a common vertex and a common side, uh, and they these are uh, going in the opposite direction. We know that those form a linear pair. So because those form a linear pair, uh, we can use the linear pair postulate, angle EIH and angle GIH are supplementary angles. And I'm just going to abbreviate there. That is the linear pair postulate. And what that means is that the measure of angle EIH plus the measure of angle GIH is 180 degrees. And that's just the definition of supplementary angles. Sorry about my writing, the computer's just doing weird stuff. And um, now we know that the measure of angle EIH is equal to the measure of angle GIH because we show that those angles are congruent up here, you see. So by the definition of congruent angles, we know that the measures are equal. So that's just the definition of congruent angles. And so we can just use substitution and say the measure of EIH plus the measure of EIH is equal to 180. And we're going from, we're, we're using substitution from here to here, just to be clear on that. Um, so now we're just going to simplify. We're going to add those two together. So we get two times the measure of angle EIH is equal to 180. And that was just simplification. And now we're going to divide both sides by 2. And we get 90. Division property of equality. And now we know that angle EIH um, is a right angle. And that's just the definition of a right angle. And so we need one more step here. We can say, because that's a right angle, we can say that EG, EG is perpendicular to FH. And uh, that's just the definition of perpendicular. So, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I forgot um, to write substitution property of equality. So go ahead and get a screenshot of all that work because the next problem is going to be uh, very similar except it's going to be not not so difficult. It's going to be a little bit hard, a little bit easier. And I want you to try number nine. Um, if the quadrilateral IJKL below is a kite, then its diagonals are perpendicular. So, <clears throat> like I said, this is very similar. Um, you're going to need to draw the diagonals and you're going to show that those diagonals are perpendicular, meaning that this angle is 90. And be aware that you're going to need to use the kite angle bisector theorem. And that's just the theorem that says that if you draw the diagonals, this diagonal in particular, then these two angles are congruent and these two angles are congruent. You're going to need to use that. And we already proved that. Also, I'd like you to uh, label the intersection point M. Um, 
And um, what you're really going to do is you're going to show that uh, two triangles are congruent. Now, you could use these two triangles, or you can use these two triangles. I'm going to use the top two triangles. So you should probably just go ahead and use those. You want to show that they're congruent. And you're also going to use the linear pair postulate, just like you did in the previous problem, to show that those angles must be the same, and therefore they're 90 degree angles. So this is kind of a, a challenge problem, I guess. Uh, but try number nine, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. Um, first of all, this is a kite. So IJKL is a kite. And by definition, that means that IL is congruent to LK. Uh, again, that's just the definition of a kite. A kite is a quadrilateral with exactly two pairs of congruent sides. So this side must be congruent to this side, and this side must be congruent to this side. Now, if I, <clears throat> if I draw the uh, diagonals, my computer will work there. If I draw these diagonals, um, we see we have the two triangles. So I show that this side is congruent to this side, and now we have to show that this side is congruent. If my computer will catch up, we have to show that this side is congruent to itself. And that, of course, is the reflexive property of congruence. So L LM is congruent to itself reflexive property of congruence. <clears throat> um, so now all we have to do is find an angle because we have two sides of these triangles. And again, we're using the top two triangles. We're going to show that they're congruent. So this side is congruent to this side, and this side is congruent to itself. So that's common to both triangles. And now we just have to find an angle. but And, and this is going to be the angle that we're going to use. Um, there may be more than one way to do this, but we're just going to use the kite angle bisector theorem. So we can say that ILM, angle ILM, is congruent to angle KLM. And that, again, is the kite angle bisector theorem. And so now we have everything we need for those top two triangles. We're going to use the SAS uh, triangle congruence postulate to say that triangle ILM is congruent to triangle KLM. Again, you have to get the right order there. Um, so now that we know that those two triangles are congruent, we can say that corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. And we can say that angle IML is congruent to angle KML. And of course, that means the measures um, of the angles are equal. Um, so at this point, again, we know we know that these, the measures of these angles are equal. Now we know from the linear pair postulate that uh, because these form a linear pair, whoops, sorry about that. Because these two angles form a linear pair, remember a linear pair is uh, two adjacent angles whose non-common sides are opposite rays. Now these are not, these are not rays, but they're they're still going the opposite direction. These sides here, so it fits the definition of a of a linear pair. So we can say that those two angles, angle IML and angle KML, form a linear pair.
<clears throat> and that's just the definition of a linear pair. You could also say for the explanation, you could just say, you know, refer to the diagram just to, to see that. Um, now we use the linear pair postulate. That tells us that angle IML and angle KML are supplementary angles. And let me make more room here. I'm just going to abbreviate there. And that is the linear pair postulate, a postulate we learned earlier, early in this course. And because we know that those are supplementary angles, um, the definition of supplementary means that uh, the measure of the angles, and those angles are IML, and um, KML, the measure of those angles add up to 180 degrees. And that's just the definition of supplementary angles. <clears throat> now, again, we prove that those angles are congruent. We prove that this angle is congruent to this angle. So we can just use substitution and plug in. So I'm going to plug in um, IML uh, for KML. And uh, that's the substitution property of equality. And then we're just going to use simplification in the next step. Add those up, simplify the expression, um, divide both sides by 2, and we get the measure of angle IML is equal to 90. Division property of equality. And now that we proved that, that the measure of that angle is IML is 90, that pretty much uh, finishes the problem. We now know that LJ is perpendicular to IK. And that's just the definition of perpendicular. Now again, to do a complete proof, you know, I guess you could try to prove that all of these angles are 90, but it, it's, it's not really necessary. If we prove that 1 is 90, then it's fairly obvious that, uh, that they are all going to be 90. So if you got those answers, good job. Now we're going to... Uh, oh, whoops, I forgot something. I'm sorry. That is the definition of uh, congruent angles. And I also forgot this thing, I'm sorry. Um, definition of a kite. That's how we know that, that uh, these two sides are congruent. That's just the definition of a kite. So for number 10, I'm gonna have you do number 10. It's, number 10 is kind of a new, a new proof. We haven't done one quite like this, but it's not really that much uh, different from what we've been doing. If the quadrilateral ABCD below is a kite, then its diagonal is divided into two pairs of congruent right triangles. So we have a kite here, and we're going to show that if we draw the, tri the, the uh, diagonals, we have two pairs of congruent right triangles. So we have these two that are both right triangles and they're congruent, and we have these two that are both right triangles and, and congruent. Um, so this, this is uh, very similar, to the, I guess, to the problem we just did. Now, there's more than one way to do this. Um, one way to do it is pretty much the exact same pathway we did in the previous problem, where you draw the diagonals and you use the uh, kite angle bisector theorem, which says that these angles are bisected, 
and then you can use the definition of a kite and the reflexive property and so on and so forth to show that those triangles are congruent. There's two pairs of congruent triangles. The problem with that is that it doesn't prove that there are right triangles. So in this problem, what I want you to do is to use the kite perpendicular diagonals theorem, which we just proved. That means that the uh, diagonals are perpendicular, meaning these angles are, are 90 degree angles. And um, I also want you to use something that uh, I don't think we've proved today. Um, I don't I don't remember for sure. I don't think we'd, we've done this, but it's the kite diagonal bisector theorem. That means that this diagonal bisects this diagonal. And that's going to help you to uh, prove very quickly that these uh, two pairs of, of triangles are not only congruent uh, pairs, but they're also right uh, right triangles. We need to prove both of those things. So why don't you go ahead and try number 10. Do your best. If you get stuck, that's okay, but I want you to give an honest attempt, and you got to use those theorems that we just mentioned. So try number 10, and when you come back, we'll do it together. All right, we're back. A, B, C, D is a kite. Now, if it's a kite, we can use the kite perpendicular diagonals theorem. So that means that uh, these diagonals are perpendicular. Um, so DB is perpendicular to AC. And again, that's the kite uh, perpendicular diagonals theorem that we proved in the previous problem. Um, and because those are perpendicular, that means that um, the, uh, that, that means that uh, angle AED, angle CED, angle uh, AEB, and angle uh, CEB are right angles. Um, I think I got all those right. And that is just the definition of perpendicular. So because those are right angles, uh, we know that all four of those triangles must be uh, right triangles. Now, because we know all those uh, angles are right angles, we can say that they're, uh, they're congruent. So angle EED or AED is congruent to angle CED. Um, we could say that they're all congruent, but we only care about uh, certain pairs. And let me move this down. And we want to say that uh, angle AEB is congruent to angle CEB. And that is the right angle congruence theorem. I didn't mention that, but we've used that quite a bit. Uh, you don't have to use the right angle congruence theorem, but it would take longer if you didn't. Um, let's see here. So now we want to show that uh, that DE is congruent to itself, and uh, BE is also congruent to itself by the reflexive property of congruence. And we have to use the uh, kite diagonal bisector theorem now to show that uh, DB bisects AC. And again, that's the kite diagonal bisector theorem.
And again, I don't think we proved that yet, but that's just one of the theorems that we learned in the uh, previous class, or whatever class that was. And so what that means is that AE is congruent to EC. That's just the definition of a segment bisector. So at this point, we can say that the top two triangles are congruent because we showed that uh, these two angles are congruent and also uh, this side is the same in both the top triangles and this side is congruent to this side in the top triangles. So we can use the SAS, triangle congruence postulate, to show that the top two triangles are congruent. We can use the same logic in the bottom triangles. We know that these angles are, con are congruent. They're both 90 degree angles. And this side and this side are congruent in the bottom two triangles. And this side is the same in both bottom uh, triangles. So again, we can use the SAS triangle congruence postulate to show that the bottom two triangles are congruent. So triangle AED is congruent to triangle CED and also um, triangle AEB is congruent to triangle CEB and that is by SAS. So AED CED, AEB, CEB, that looks right. So we've shown that all that the, there's two pairs of congruent triangles. That's this part. We know that they're congruent. And we've shown that uh, they're, they're, uh, all the triangles are right triangles. And that is this part here. So if you got something like that, good job. If you got stuck through the, some of that, that's OK. Um, as long as you have the right idea, that's the most important thing. All right, on to number 11. If the trapezoid ABCD below is isosceles, then the angles in each base pair are congruent. So <clears throat> we're assuming that this is isosceles, which means that this side is congruent to this side. And if that's true, uh, we're going to show that these two angles must be congruent and also these two angles must be congruent. Those are the uh, base pairs. And to do this, we're going to have to uh, draw an auxiliary line or an auxiliary line segment like so. So this is something that is a little weird. We haven't done this before and we're going to call that point E. So we're going to start out with the uh, given information, ABCD is an isosceles trapezoid and we're going to we're going to need to prove that this uh, shape here is a parallelogram. In order to show that it's a parallelogram we have to say that AD is parallel to BC and we know that because that's just the definition of a trapezoid. Remember, a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with one pair, uh, exactly one pair of uh, parallel sides. And we also know that AB is parallel to DE. And I don't know if I forgot if I mentioned that, but we're drawing this a line segment so that it's parallel with AB. Now some students might say, well wait a second, we, we can't do that. How, how, how are we allowed to do that? Well yes, we can we can you know draw an auxiliary line segment if, if we need to so that it's parallel. That's completely legal. Um, so again we're drawing it so that it's parallel to AB. 
So we can just say AB is parallel to DE, and we can just say it's drawn that way. <clears throat> there might be a better way to describe it, but I'm just going to say drawn. Uh, so now we can say that um, AB, ED is a parallelogram. because that's just the definition of a parallelogram. And now that we know it's a parallelogram, we can say that AB is congruent to DE by the um, parallelogram opposite sides theorem. That's one of the four parallelogram theorems that we learned in a previous class. And we also know, because this is an isosceles trapezoid, we also know that AB is congruent to um, DC. <clears throat> and you can see what's going to happen here. We're going to use the transitive property of congruence. Um, so if, if, both, if, if two things are both equal to AB, then that means uh, that they're congruent to themselves. But I'm going to first say uh, this is the definition of an isosceles trapezoid. And so we can say that DC is congruent to... Um, DC is congruent to DE by the transitive property of congruence. And what we've done so far if we, is we've shown that this side is congruent to this side. And now we're going to use the um, isosceles Sorry, my computer's not working right. We're going to need to use the isosceles triangle theorem, which says that if two sides of a triangle are congruent, then the angles opposite those sides are congruent. So if we know that these two sides are congruent, that proves that these two angles must be congruent. So angle DEC, angle DEC is congruent to angle C, and we don't need three-letter notation for angle C. We can just write it as angle C. And that is the isosceles uh, triangle theorem. Now at this point you might be thinking, well, um, who cares? Well, why do we just do that? Well, if we know that these two angles are congruent, um, then we're going to be able to show that uh, angle C is congruent to angle B, which is the whole point of this. Now, we know that uh, these two line segments are parallel, and if you consider this to be a transversal, that means that uh, these, two, these two angles must be congruent because they're corresponding angles. Again, we know AB and, and uh, DE are parallel because we, we drew uh, the DE. We drew DE that way. So by the corresponding angles postulate, we know angle B is congruent to angle DEC. So angle B is congruent to angle DEC by the corresponding angles postulate. And of course, you can see here, two things are congruent, two angles are congruent to angle DEC, therefore the angles are congruent to each other. Angle B is congruent to angle C. And that's what we're trying to prove. So that is the transitive property of congruence. And you might think that we're done at that point, but we're not quite done. We've shown that these angles 
Sorry, my computer's doing weird things. We've shown that these two angles are congruent, but we also have to show that these upper angles are congruent. So we can get rid of that auxiliary line at this point, I guess. Um, well, I should probably keep it, I guess, just so you can refer back to that. So um, now we know because, because these line segments are parallel, uh, and this we can consider a, a transversal by the consecutive interior angles th uh, theorem these two angles must be supplementary that was one of the transversal theorems that we learned in a previous class so um, angle a and angle b are supplementary And also, we're going to use the same logic over here. Um, we're going to draw, the, consider these to be two parallel lines, and we have a transversal here. And these two angles must be supplementary by the same logic. So we can also say that angle D and angle C are supplementary. But I'm going to move some stuff up here. So angle A and angle B are supplementary, but uh, angle D and angle uh, C are also supplementary. Sorry, it's scrunched in there. And that is the consecutive interior angles theorem. Now, if those are supplementary, that means that the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B equals 180 degrees and the measure of angle D plus the measure of angle C is also 180 degrees and that is just the definition of supplementary angles. Now you can see that both of these expressions are equal to 180 so we can use the transitive property of, of, uh, con of equality to show that those two expressions are equal. So the measure of angle A plus the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle D plus the measure of angle C by the transitive property of equality, but recall that we proved that uh, angle B is congruent to angle C. So if angle B is congruent to angle C, um, then of course we know the measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle C, and that is just the definition of congruent angles. And then we can use substitution. So measure of angle A plus the uh, measure of angle C is equal to the measure of angle D plus the measure of angle C. Substitution property of equality. Then we can subtract C from both sides and we get the measure of angle A is equal to the measure of angle D. That is the subtraction property of equality. And then, of course, the last step is uh, angle A is congruent to angle D. And that is the definition of congruent angles. So what we proved is that these these uh, obtuse angles are congruent. First we proved that the um, acute angles were congruent and then we proved that the obtuse angles are congruent. So I know that was kind of a long problem. Um, the last problem we're going to do today is a similar problem but it's going to be a lot easier.
and I'm going to have you do this one on your own, if angle F is congruent to angle G in the trapezoid EFGH below, then it's an isosceles trapezoid. So this is the trapezoid one pair base angles theorem. Um, so we know that this angle is congruent to this angle. And we're then going to prove that uh, this side is congruent to this side. So we're kind of going backwards from the previous problem. Um, now, we're only going to show this for uh, the acute angles. Uh, I don't think it's necessary to show for the uh, obtuse angles for the for the reasons that we just went over because we showed how to how to you know make the translation there. So you're going to use the same type of technique, really. You're going to draw this uh, auxiliary line and, or line segment, and you're going to draw it so that it's parallel with this side. And what you're going to do is you're going to first show that this is a parallelogram, and then you're going to show that these two angles are congruent. Now, if those angles are congruent, that's going to prove that these two sides are congruent. So we're going to use the converse of the isosceles triangle theorem. It's the isosceles triangle converse theorem, so you're going to want to get a screenshot of that. And so we're kind of we're kind of going backwards. And then we're going to use that to show that the uh, the, the legs of the, the trapezoid, this side and this side, are congruent. So go ahead and try that problem. And you might want to get a screenshot of the problem that we just did because it might be helpful in the same way that we had to show that uh, we have a parallelogram you're going to have to show that uh, with number 12 also now I want you to label this point I um, so when, when I do the problem you can follow along with me so go ahead and try number 12 and when you come back we'll do it together alright we're back EFGH is a trapezoid. We know that. That's a given. Now it's probably best to go ahead and show that EFIH is a parallelogram. So um, we know that uh, we know that EH is parallel to FG. And that's just the definition of a trapezoid. Um, it's a quadrilateral with one pair of sides uh, parallel. And we also know that EF is parallel to HI. And it was just drawn that way. And so therefore, we can say that EFIH is a parallelogram by the definition of a parallelogram. So now that we know it's a parallelogram, we can use that as we go along. But we can see that uh, if these two sides are parallel, then corresponding angles are going to be uh, congruent by the corresponding angles postulate. So angle F is congruent to angle HIG by the corresponding angles postulate. <clears throat> and we also know that angle F is congruent to angle G. So notice that these uh, two angles are congruent to the same angle. And by the way, that was given. I was given in the problem. So they're congruent to the same angle, so we know that angle HIG is congruent to angle G. That's the transitive property of equality. And now we know that HI, side HI, is congruent to HG by the isosceles triangle converse theorem. That was this theorem that we mentioned up here. 
Now, because this is a parallelogram, we know that Fe is congruent to IH. Sorry about that. Computer jumping around for no reason. We know that Fe is congruent to IH because the uh, parallelogram opposite sides theorem, that's one of the four theorems we learned for parallelograms, one of the four primary theorems. So Fe is congruent to Hi, and that is the parallelogram opposite sides theorem. Now, if we know that Fe is congruent to Hi, and we also know that Hi is congruent to Hg, which is step eight down there, then you can see where we're going with this. Hg, by the transitive property, Hg must be congruent to Fe. And that's what we're trying to show. So that is the um, transitive property. of congruence. And now that now we can say that EF GH is an isosceles trapezoid by the definition of an isosceles trapezoid. So if you got something similar to that, good job. As you can see, it was kind of just uh, going backwards from the previous problem. Um, so we don't have time to do these last problems, and it's not really necessary. Those problems are kind of long. So if you want to take screenshots of all the work that we did today, go ahead and do that now. Here's screenshot one and screenshot two and screenshot three and screenshot four and screenshot five and screenshot six and screenshot seven. Now don't go before you get your homework. Here's the homework. Here's screenshot number one. Screenshot number two. And screenshot number three. Screenshot number four. And screenshot number five. Now, I want you to understand that uh, I give you hints because some of these problems require you to use various theorems. For example, here on, the, on number one, I say use the consecutive interior angles theorem. Um, number two, I say you must use the rectangle, rectangle parallelogram theorem and so on and so forth. So I'm giving you hints to these problems because again, it's not really fair for me to give you uh, proofs that you've never done before. It's kind of a tall order, but uh, I'm giving you hints, and these are going, going to be challenging. That's why there's only 10 of them. You know, proofs are difficult. They are challenging. So if you get stuck with some of these proofs, don't feel bad, but you do need to get the general idea of some of these proofs. And, and again, I, I want to repeat, these are challenging problems. So if you feel that these are, are difficult, that's normal. That's completely normal for students to uh, struggle with these. That's why I'm only giving you 10 problems. Um, so get that homework done completely correctly and neatly and make sure it's in order in your binder. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next class.